Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for attending this evening's uh, meeting in corporate finance and performance scrutiny. Um, I'd like to advise everyone that the meeting will be recorded and posted on the Council's YouTube channel. And can I also remind everyone that when they speak, they should switch on their microphone and when they finish speaking to turn the microphone off. I think we're all pretty practiced at that. Uh, apologies for absence I have from Councillor John Hills, Simon Pearce, Jit Ranabat, Sandra Thomas, and Peter Baker. Um, any other apologies? Any left? No, thank you. Uh, moving on to urgent business. We do have a matter of urgent business, which is the highways term contractor procurement 2024 to 2028. Uh, a meeting of overview and scrutiny last week, it was agreed that we would delegate this item to this panel. This is essentially the um, ongoing renewals of the contract with Riney with a single award for highways for the past two years. So it was done again with exception this year uh, on the condition that it was brought to scrutiny to check that it was on track for renewal next year with a proper tender process rather than an automatic renewal to the incumbent every time. So what this panel is essentially being asked to do is make sure that stays on track and get a kind of full report on it. Now, looking at the timings, what I'd suggest to this panel, um, and I can send out a briefing note after this, is we take a written update in December to make sure things are on track. The latest update I've had shows that things are on track. Um, so we take a written update in December, and then we get a full update in March 24 which kind of aligns with their timetable for tendering, just to make sure everything's on track with that. Are members happy to do that and take it then? Yeah, Councillor Smith. Um, <clears throat> I don't think happy is quite the word. Um, I don't think we've got much choice, but I am extremely disappointed. Um, I've been on this council for 22 years, and Ryanies have been the appointed contractor for highways for the whole of that time, as far as I know. And I don't see any reason why we haven't managed to get it put out to tender at the right time. Um, and we keep on renewing automatically with them. Um, and I have seen the quality of some of my work, you, their work. You can come in my road and have a look at it. And it's not great. Um, and I think we can do better, both in price and in, in quality. So, you know, if, if Ryan is win on a fair, open, competitive tender process, then so be it, but just handing it out to them year on year um, and extending a contract for, for mediocre work, putting it politely, um, is, is really not good enough. And I, I, I would like when we bring it back in December, not only to check that it's on time and on track, but to have an explanation of why we can never quite get it done at the right time, because we know it's gonna happen. Yeah, I'll come to you in a second, uh, Councillor. Um, so I think on that, I, I completely agree. It's an unacceptable situation we're in. So when it came to the Chair of Overview and Scrutiny to sign off on the exception, um, we did have a good lengthy discussion and basically agreed that this does, can't happen again, for a start. I think it's happened too long, and I'm pleased that we conditioned that approval with increased scrutiny of the contract and the process of it as it went up. So I think... I mean, we could ask them to come in person in December. I think we'll take a written update because not much would change once we'd look at it. But as I say, I'll circulate what we have and then feedback to me on email if you think you want to bring them in sooner. But I think as a straw man, we'd take a written in December and then ask some of those more searching questions in March there and have a good, good session with them and kind of find out what went wrong. We've had a number of reasons why not. Someone left, someone dropped the ball, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so <laughs> I, think, I think some of them... Yeah, it, it's a huge contract, yeah. Uh, Councillor Vandenbroek. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I agree with Councillor Smith, um, and I hadn't realised quite how long it had been rolling over, which I find quite shocking. What I'm asking for is, in the written update, are there some general uh, benchmarking metrics that we can use, that we can put the Ryanair's work against, uh, against what happens in other counts, just to get a, a feel about whether... Councillor Smith's view that, that, well, I haven't seen great stuff either, but, um, you know, get a feel for how well are they doing against other uh, contractors in other boroughs? Uh, yeah, I mean, we can certainly look at that. So I want to be careful not to stray into the highway scrutiny panel 
and the work they do in terms of that, so regen and, and, and that area there. So what this is focused on for us is the contract process as corporate finance and performance, that it's actually a proper tender has been done and it's gone out and that it's on track. So I don't think we need to be careful that we don't strain to looking at the conditions of the road and the work they do actually. It's that the contract process is underway and it's not really about Rhinies at this stage because it's going out to tender for multiple vendors to come back and say, this is our bid. So we need to check that that's on track. So it's not about the performance of Rhinies, it's about our performance in putting the tender out to doing that, which we haven't been doing previously and just awarding it to Rhinie. So okay. it's keeping I, that on track. I, I follow that difference, but I, I think it might be interesting. I wasn't looking at uh, comparing Rhinies with other contractors. I was talking about overall, just feel how, I'm, it, how, you know, what might we be losing? I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I, yes, yeah, sorry, it's quite difficult to get that fine difference. Let's ask one more question, yeah. which is, um, I think it would be interesting to know this by December. Um, it is a huge contract. Is it the size of the contract that means that there are so few people that can bid for it because of the size of it? Or are there other people who can bid for contracts of that size? And if that were the case, I don't know if it is, if that were the case, is there any mileage in trying to split that contract maybe into geographical bits of the borough to give to smaller people rather than to say, you know, actually the only, the only name of the game for contracts of this size is Rhinies, so that's what we're going to get. Yeah, so m my understanding is it's never been a, a lack of supplies that's been the issue. It's, uh, to, to put it bluntly, it's been getting our act together to get a tender out there before the deadline looms like that, and then we have a statutory duty to maintain the highways, so our hands are tied. So, but if you want to drop me that question on an email, I can pass it on in advance of December, because what I may say is give it to a large organisation to then sub it out across the borough, or do we manage that ourselves? But I think that's a very valid question, and could tie into some of the social value stuff when we're looking at that contract, and that's something I'll be keen to see in the tender is what questions are we asking of social value as well when that comes up. I think for such a large contract, I think that's important and keeping it local ties to that a bit sometimes and some of the GLAB work, which we might be able to talk about on that as well. Um, but yeah. Okay, so in principle, we're happy with that timeline, but obviously open to feedback on email as we go and any questions that arise after that. Yep, great. Okay, we'll add that in there. That moves us on to declarations of interest. Do members have any in interest to declare? See none, no. Uh, minutes, are members happy to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 20th of July? Okay, it's fine. <laughs> so it's it's as, as the, yeah. <laughs> I'll sign those up, <laughs> that's okay. So. Okay, that moves us on to item five, which is an update on procurement and social value uh, to be presented by Ian Tasker. Thank you, Ian. I understand you had to uh, come in a bit last minute with the train strikes to cover this one, so it's much appreciated. Thank you. Chair, yes, so I was coming along anyway, but the uh, head of procurement has, relies on trains to get to and from Greenwich, so uh, she's a little bit inconvenienced today, but uh, hopefully... If there's any real detail questions that you go into, I can take them away for written, but hopefully I'll be able to cover most. Um, this is the six monthly procurement update report that's provided uh, to scrutiny on progress with various procurement matters in accordance with uh, contract standing order 11.3. It provides a review of procurement, including how the review is going under rethinking finance, it has four distinct themes, strategy, which includes social value, category management, contract management and governance and process. The review is underway and there's been an engagement with members on social value, including drop-in sessions in the Woolwich Town Hall and ideas will be incorporated in a new social value framework to be put forward for agreement in 2024. Progress has been made, but there are resource issues in procurement. It's a very difficult market to recruit to, which I'll put another hat on in the next item. Uh, currently, the, uh, the team is having to focus on operational matters, and we've got potentially one, two new people starting later this month, and we'll pick up 
uh, progress on the strategy and social value uh, by the end of the year, once they're bedded in. Current government's processes, including contract standing orders, uh, we're looking to review to ensure the council's procurement operations are streamlined and fit for purpose. Alongside this, there's two new pieces of legislation coming along, which will change the landscape quite significantly. Uh, the Procurement Act and provide a selection regime, uh, and they will require to changes to processes and contract standing orders with the legislation as it goes through. No final date for implementations of these have been agreed, but it's likely, uh, certainly the uh, uh, Procurement Act is likely to be the end of 2024. It may go through Parliament, but will need secondary legislation to uh, flash out all the details. So it's a piece of work we have to be mindful of that's coming along and has a change in emphasis based on the consultation that's been done so far. Happy to take any questions. Councillor Vanderbilt. Okay, following on from what we just heard about the contract with Rhinies, under the sort of governance and processes, where are we in just ensuring there is <coughs> a schedule, a list of, of what is going to come up when? I do remember in a previous um, scrutiny meeting on this that the head of uh, procurement did say that it was sometimes difficult to know what different directorates were doing, that sometimes things stayed within the directorate and didn't, didn't get to uh, central procurement. But I kind of like see a timeline of, you know, regular procurement tenders sh should, should be an underlying sort of spine to all of this work. Um, so, w w was there a little bit of a failure with that at this end, or, or not failure? Could it have been done better? Um, the, uh, the, the, the the responsibilities of procurement and directors. Uh, first, I just cover that point off first. Directors are responsible for their procurements. Procurement is there to actually aid and support them. So. Um, their uh, procurement, uh, we will maintain what is known as a contracts register, and we can use that, but it doesn't contain every single procurement that uh, is actually done. The contracts register uh, only uh, contains procurements over £100,000, uh, if uh, that makes sense. So uh, we do look to monitor and talk to directors. As you can say, the, the Ryanese one is an example of where that that sort of process failed. Um, it's, uh, the Director of Finance has strengthened the overall resources in procurement, so there is more resources there now. And we do have uh, a, a business partner now uh, working with every directorate. So we have better intelligence now around that, but I wouldn't say it's actually a perfect exercise yet. Thank you for that. And, and I think building on Councillor Vandenbrook's question, a specific answer to this panel previously, or recommendation, I should say, has been, and I appreciate this could be picked up in March, but it's procurement, so we'll do it here, is the centralised register of CSO exceptions and how that was coming along. I wonder if there'd been any more progress on that. Uh, uh, on the centralised register, well, it, there's two actual pieces of uh, process, uh, progress. Um, we have looked at actually how we change the a report that is uh, we will be taking through uh, IPC and then to cabinet um, so we're actually looking at that at the present time and with a, uh, a diff slightly different approach to uh, how we actually report to give you um, it, it's probably that the current report has got so much detail it's almost impenetrable back at the back so the report will look to have a uh, almost like a table that summarises them uh, a lot clearer. So that's one aspect to try and make the presentation to members and then we can discuss as to how you would then want to progress looking at those. Yes, we're in currently discussing with Digital about how we can actually um, make that, um, that central register um, uh, and keep it up to date on a regular basis. So we are progressing that work, but... Um, in fairness, it's probably not the highest priority in digital with the current financial position. 
so it will it will it may be a little bit longer to actually develop but we are tracking and moving that forward and on that so I'm not on the first part I'm not really worried about there being too much detail I would rather that in the reports just to read that back so don't worry about powering that back it's more my concern is that you know as we discovered in this process that it's down to the directorates to tell you when there's an exception not for you to know and I, 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 do we so there's the technical element that you've got to implement I get that but are you finding that there's going to be cultural pain how are you securing that to getting them to tell you we're actually talking to legal at the present time because every waiver and exemption has to go through and the final stage is to actually get legal comments. So um, we're looking at uh, using uh, that business process and inserting at the back end of that business process so that we actually uh, uh, track them all at that stage and so that we can uh, ensure that we're not reliant on directors and we're actually using the current business process that ends that, that ends with legal um, so uh, the, uh, Steph, uh, Seth is actually talking to legal at the moment and they do have uh, they keep a log which you would naturally expect that legal have so we will start to use that in that way and not be reliant on directors we will just then uh, look to produce the information from there and uh, that we're currently doing that in this current uh, uh, cycle as we speak for the Jan to June uh, uh, reports. Okay that's really good to hear and ju just to be clear on that's so illegal have agreed for you guys to be inserted at that stage and provide that information? Uh, legal have provided us with the list of all the ones that uh, that are from their log and so we work very closely there's weekly meetings between uh, the uh, head of procurement and the manager in legal uh, over the procurement service they have a very good close working relationship and so there is no problem with getting that information it, it, so uh, it, we will use it uh, moving forward with a, a change in our processes good good and uh, the, the way my thinking is going is does that need formalizing and would a recommendation from this panel help in that situation? Uh, I don't, uh, it will be done. It's, it doesn't need any formalizing or um, support from members to achieve that. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Councillor Smith. Yeah, um, it's on the question of social value. <clears throat> and whilst I'm firmly in favor of, of using social value as a means to doing our procurement, I have heard, um, anecdotally from some senior members of staff, um, including within finance, that it will inevitably push the cost of contracts up. Um, and I don't think that's the intention of members. So I am concerned that in a, in a time when we are supposed to be driving costs down and giving our residents you know, the best value of money as possible for the council tax payments that they pay for us, that, that we may be paying more for services because we've built something in. Um, you know, I, I always imagined that social value meant that we extracted more, not paid more for getting it, because otherwise we could just use that money in paying for social things ourselves. So I want some kind of assurance that that's not the case, um, and some sort of monitoring put in to, to what the differences of the contracts are so that we can plot them as their issue to how much more they were than, uh, than what we paid before and, and you know, what we're actually getting on top of it rather than paying through it through the back door for want of a better terms. Right, uh, uh, first off I think try and clarify some terms that people use it might be helpful and I'll also refer you to um, just under 4.2 in the table there the the strategy um, we have to develop a clear procurement strategy striking the balance between the delivery of best value and the delivery of wider social value so best value which is what you're referring to getting the best value for the the actual uh, from the contract is what um, has to be a, a primary that. I would refer to what the cabinet member uh, said at a meeting I was at. Social value is the icing on the cake. It's not the actual cake itself. We have to make sure that the, that the actual procurement works and it works within the 
um, uh, to deliver best value. Um, coming back to what do people mean by social value? Um, social value under the uh, actual act is exactly as you described, where you gain extra value from um, the procurement and its added value and should not affect the actual price itself. Um, and you should, and when we're designing social value in procurements, that we should be very mindful of that and doing that. People can tend to also use social value in its wider sense, which can include uh, delivering social value. So, for example, a number of years ago, the decision was taken to include London living wage in the home care contracts. Now, that's delivering social value, and it has a, a significant cost, but uh, it isn't social value in terms of the act. So we just have to be careful sometimes as to um, when we're uh, referring to social value, are we talking about almost like a strategic principle decision, or are we talking about the actual act itself? And it's those strategic decisions that um, uh, potentially can have a significant impact on the actual um, uh, cost. So um, if you're building in a, um, higher requirements and into that because of so social benefit, I use that term rather than social value, you can increase cost, uh, but it's then measuring whether that social benefit. I think probably members would agree that the London living wage was worth building in and it, it did cost us more. So hopefully does that answer your question, councillor? Sorry, I wouldn't want to see, um, God, I can't do figures off the top of my head, but if we're issuing a contract for two million, say, um, I wouldn't want to see it costing us 20 million, 100,000, so that whoever's managing the contract can use that money on, on, you know, what they believe to be the social value, because if that were the case, we may as well have kept that 100,000 and and spent it on what we felt was the right thing to do. And I, I, that, that's my concern, that they're going to go upwards because people still want their percentage out of it. Yeah, uh, I completely understand where you're coming from and, and one of the reasons to strengthen and have business partners involved in the actual uh, procurement, so particularly at an earlier stage, is to make sure that social value is considered in that, uh, in, would that, as, with that exact thought as part in mind as well. So. Thank you. And just touching on that, it, so I guess it's very difficult, well, tell me if I'm wrong, for us to benchmark what something would cost with social value and without social value, right? To have that comparator, is that possible to do? I, uh, in terms of, um, you, that that's very actual difficult to do because um, when you look at contracts, uh, you shouldn't just bring the specification forward that you've had before. And uh, benchmarking it against, you, you know, previously becomes quite a challenging exercise. When you start, you could try and benchmark across local authorities, but that um, brings challenges in itself because um, not wishing to raise sort of like um, a, a highways contract, it's reasonably homogenous across local authorities, but local authorities do still have differences. There may be a standard specification, but they will what they include in contracts in terms of that. There's very few contracts that are really, truly uh, homogenous. Um, something like a postal delivery contract with the Royal Mail. Uh, there is only, you know, uh, uh, you, there you can actually join together and benchmark at all local authorities. So it's a very difficult exercise to actually tear that apart. I think you've got to have the controls up the front rather than assess it at the back end. And you touched earlier on the more kind of strategic social value like living wage, et cetera, et cetera, that in terms of the act when we go to procure when we talk about social value in there do we ask for quite nebulous social value or do we ask for some quite specific items as it were the social value framework provides um officers with uh, a framework on which they can actually uh hang the requirements that they 
actually ask and the challenge is trying to match the individual procurement to uh, the framework itself and that was part of the work we're trying to do with members is understand what they would like to see extra from um, uh, uh, from um, uh, procurements over and above the specification and itself but at no cost so um, uh, it's uh, we have to uh, you could run into problems and in, uh, maybe to give an example of what councillor smith is talking about if you start asking for um, say a social value fund uh, contributions to a social value fund uh, which some councils do you can then run into that does inflate your, your your potential costs because the contractor would uh, put there so that I wouldn't like to go down that line of there because you might, all you do is create uh, you've taken one money from one part of the council and making it available in another so but um, yeah it's an area that needs to be carefully managed through thank you for that and just fi finally from me on the 4.4 on the procurement bill and I know it's not kind of passed yet or got royal assent, but do you, a lot of the things we've discussed, CSO, contract signing orders, exceptions, things like that, do you see this kind of driving a, a lorry for all of this and kind of making us go back to square one as it stands at the moment? I think as, um, uh, there's an interesting comparison between the two pieces of legislation that are going through and I wouldn't like to go into too much in terms of, because uh, the devil will always be in the detail. But the health legislation is going much more towards allowing um, um, those contracts to be a lot more direct towards, a lot more working with partners to actually speed up procurement processes and make them uh, far more engaging and um, uh, joint processes with the community. The, the bill as the consultation and how it's emerging is almost going the other way in terms of um, making it far more onerous on the local authority in terms of their processes and their transparency and publishing. Um, so, and it may actually mandate what people's contract standing orders may look like and reduce local authorities' uh, thing. But that, the devil is in the detail. There's, a, there's often a big difference between what is said and what eventually comes through. But the two pieces of legislation are almost going in uh, differing uh, directions. And uh, it could be an interesting... Uh, uh, when, when, it, when the legislation does get Parsons' cart coming through, there will be a lot of work to do to re-look at that. And contract standing orders will need a rewrite, even if we haven't rewritten and to change some of the uh, difficulties that we have with them now. That's great, that's a really good insight, thank you. That. Um, any more questions or comments from members on item five? Um, no, Ian, thank you very much for that. I think um, we'll move on to item six, which is the Human Resources Performance Monitoring 2022-23, to be presented by Stephanie Mills. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so, yep, yeah, just a brief introduction to the report. So, this report is to provide members with an update of the Council's workforce and people management practices. This is generally presented as an annual report. I think we probably came about six months ago with a rather large report covering the previous two-year period. Um, notwithstanding that, this um, I'm sure you've seen from the detail, it's a very detailed report which serves to give an update on the positions that we presented in March. Um, it generally covers the key work streams that are being worked across the HR professional services in its entirety, across each of the technical services. Um, and clearly there is a lot of detail about the data, some of the interventions past, present and planned. Um, so yes, very happy to, to answer any questions that, that colleagues may have on the report itself. Thank you very much for that. Do members have any questions on the reports? Councillor Smith. Yeah, um, I'm a little bit concerned about the sickness absence rising. Um, 
I, I don't quite know how to work the maths. I'm not a finance person. But um, the... Um, sorry, I've lost the bit where it tells me it's increased from something to something. It's about one point... One point one... It's increased to 12.5 from 11.6, so it's almost 0.9, isn't it? 0.9. I don't. That's how you work it. Yeah. Yes. Apologies, um, councillor. Just looking for the for the specific point in the report. It <laughs> take me a little while to wade it's, through. It's um, page 28, and it's sort of halfway down the bullet points on that page, which says sickness absence has increased from um, 11.6 days to 12.5 days. And then it says, see another page for more details. Um, but then I looked on page 80 for the table of um, how many full-time employees we had. Um, and there's a bit of inconsistency on the appendix to page 80, but you know, I'm not getting out my pram over that. Um, but we got something like three and a half thousand full-time employees. So if that's a day for each of those employees. That's an awful lot of days um, that we're losing through sickness absence. And, you know, I read somewhere else that, you know, we are going to review the policy. Look, I would be the last person to say that we need to be draconian on sickness and treat people as other organisations do. But that's a lot of days lost. And that affects our residents because for everybody that's off sick, other staff are covering them, and that means phones aren't getting answered and and things aren't being pursued and, you know, people's housing benefits being delayed. Um, th there are a lot of occasions where um, nobody bothers to put the out-of-office message on for somebody that's out, so people keep emailing the same person and getting no response. I mean, I won't kind of go on about, you know... You have to appreciate, as a councillor, we get residents talking to us about their perception of what's going on and how they're being treated. Um, so, uh, a rambling one way to say that I know an organisation that is a public sector organisation, um, and its sickness absence policies are quite dra draconian. They just sack somebody for having two days off within a six-month period. Um, which I wouldn't say that we go down there, but it seems an awful lot. You know, 12, 12 point something days um, is like two and a half weeks for every full-time employee. And I know it doesn't work out, because I know there are some that don't have a day, um, and I know some of it's long-term sickness and whatever. But, Chair, I would like coming back to a future panel, because we did do this a number of years ago, and got sickness absence down, and it's creeping up again. Um, and I think it really does need a, a look in detail at, at what we're doing with sickness absence. It's, it's, it's odd days, isn't it, that concern me, people that have like two days off a month or whatever with um, you know, no long-term medical conditions and whatever, and it sometimes just gets treated as, in their view, as another bit of annual leave. Um, you know, I don't think that we can tolerate that. I think we've got a duty to our residents to make sure that the staff we employ, when they're able, provide the service that they should be providing and that it's, it's not fair on colleagues or residents or anybody else when... But equally, if people have got long-term medical conditions and need, you know, need... A, um, what, what's the thing you call it? It's not a facility. Reasonable adjustments. Reasonable adjustments, that's it. It's a long time since I did a tribunal. Um, but, um, you know, we need to make sure that we provide all of that, absolutely. But creeping up by three and a half thousand days a year is worrying. Thank you. Shall I, shall I take these two questions together? Do you want to come in, Councillor? Yeah, yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> with that... There's a lot of information here, and I, I did mark up one version of it, and I've lost my mark up, so I'm trying to remember some of the things that I, I pulled out. But some of it around the sickness, there are two things. One is benchmarking it against other local authorities and, and other people 
doing as bad, yep, having the same sort of trouble, um, and might some of that, you know, be things that we're not really coming quite to grips with yet, like long COVID. I notice the hu that huge percentage of some of the sort of fatigue, etc. I'm, I'm just quite interested whether there's any work, not necessarily within the council on that. And the other one is the difference between um, directorates, etc. Now, obviously, there are some where there's a lot of musculoskeletal because people are doing that kind of physical work. Of course, having been properly trained and and uh, abiding by health and safety, etc. But you know, this is an impossible question, so I'm throwing it out there. Do you think that some of this might be culture in different departments rather than? Of, of expectation if you'd like the triple before you answer because it's all related to sickness absolutely if that's, yes, <laughs> so that's fine so looking at the table on page 97 sickness absence by reasoning i think at the previous scrutiny panel on this item councillor vandenbrook raised this point and it was a very good one it would be good to see these associated to some way to directorate so to quell the concern a lot of these are you know musculoskeletal problems back neck problems have we got frontline workers injuring themselves and that's causing them to be sick. So how do we kind of capture that information there? Is, is there a particular trend within a directorate for the type of absence reason? All right, so fully loaded. I'm going to give this my best shot. First of all, I would start, councillor, by saying absolutely 12 and a half days per employee. FTE for employees is too high. There is a national context that sits behind this as well as a local one. So I think it's useful to kind of keep that in mind as well. So we know that the CIPD recently published a report which identified that sickness absence days had increased by the equivalent, I think, of what we are seeing in the performance report. It was on average two FTE days lost per employee, which is the highest we've seen in, in a decade. Now, clearly, there are lots of factors that sit behind that, and we aren't immune to, to some of those factors. There is a real push, I think, in starting to address some of the immediate issues, and I totally agree. Part of that will be looking at, do the documents, the structures, the policies, the frameworks that we have in place currently support us to effectively manage sickness absence on the grounds day to day? And I think there is an element of management capability that sits alongside that as well. So I will start by saying that that is absolutely number two on the list of priorities in terms of the policy framework review that's happening within the service at the moment. What we are trying to do, and I guess this is where it comes into its own as part of a much wider broad brush approach, is rather than kind of taking a very narrow view of attendance management, we are looking at this as a kind of holistic, overarching, well-being uh, sort of strategy piece. Now, again, part of the research, and I think where we are clear that some of the... Uh, I suppose uh, some of the leverage that's going to help us to crack some of this is going to be to start to look at some of the preventative measures that we need to be putting in place as well. And I think well-being is certainly going to be a key factor of that. We are not an outlier in terms of the number one reasons for sickness absence within Greenwich. So stress, mental health related conditions still sit squarely at, at the top of the list of things uh, that, that cause people to be unwell. And there are obviously lots of factors which I think we are seeing the tail end effect of COVID, um, sort of the national situation in terms of public sector more generally. People are feeling the pinch, for want of a better word. You know, burnout, we know, is, is a very real issue. So there is a lot for us to do in terms of prevention as well as cure. But, Councillor Vanderbrook, again, I think to answer your question about is there a cultural issue in some areas, I think the very honest answer to that question is, is probably yes. And that is certainly where we are focusing a lot of our attentions, where we know the trend is showing us that there is a, a high proportion of short-term absence. And that generally is where we are focusing a lot of the day-to-day -day operational attention. But there is clearly a management uh, sort of development piece, I think, that sits here as well. Um, and taking the point about the feedback from the last panel, yes, there was a lot of work that we'd started to do to look at where some of the high levels of musculoskeletal absence um, exists. Now, unsurprisingly, and I think the report captures this, we obviously have um, one of the largest retained workforces in London, so I think there is a sort of natural trend that you would expect to see, that we have high levels of absence in that area, and it is predominantly within the blue-collar workforce sector. Now, we have started to unpick that by directorate, and we are working very closely as part of a, an initial look at the, the health and well-being strategy 
in partnership with our health and safety colleagues and public health colleagues as well, to take a more coordinated, joined up and collaborative approach to looking at some of these things, recognising that we aren't going to find the answers in isolation. I will end by saying that we are still quite early in the development of that piece of work, so there is a strategic board that exists to look at this. Um, that is currently looking at the development of the health and wellbeing strategy more widely. We have had a very early kickoff conversation about the sickness absence policy review, starting with a strategic look at what are the key things that that review needs to focus on and how do we bring that into the wider overarching work that's happening here. So it's a huge project. It certainly isn't going to be one that we're going to address overnight. There are immediate interventions in place. Um, but I totally agree that we, we need to prioritise bringing that down. I think the cost of sickness absence is sitting pretty within this report. It's, it's actually not a pretty figure and we absolutely need to work on bringing that down. Thank you very much for that. Uh, any follow-up questions? Um, yeah, do you want to use your microphone? Um, they're not, I'm, I'm sure that you have some figures of this somewhere. Um, and again, uh, it's not anecdotal, I've seen it many times myself, but um, the number of people that go off sick after a capability procedure begins is um, pretty, pretty high. Um, are we able to provide any figures on that? Because I know in reality what that means is that um, directorates end up with effectively a vacancy and again, you know, I always think of the rest of the staff that have to cover that because uh, there's nobody else to do that job. And um, I'm pretty sure all of that feeds into the stress, depression, uh, depression, anxiety for other staff when they're all, you know, if they've got two or three people in their department that are off sick for whatever reason and, and things are unable to move forward because it holds up a procedure. Um, then they're, they're likely to be affected. And I'm just wondering if we're thinking of trying to create something that helps with that. Um, and the other one, which I know is controversial, um, because we've had it all with COVID jabs, is that, you know, the number of infections. Yes, winter is... <laughs> I'm just about to mention coughs and colds, Denise. So, so you, 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 did, <laughs> you did the sound effects for me. Um, you know, coughs, colds and flu, and people getting their flu vaccines. And I, I don't think we have a very good take up on people doing that either, do we? Unfortunately, I don't have the figures for either of those. We certainly take those away as action points, though. I mean, I absolutely agree. I mean, it, it often goes hand in hand that you will see processes run parallel. Um, where action that is perceived to be quite draconian is, is taken in individual cases, generally warranted, but it's not a particularly nice thing to be subjected to. So we don't record specifically where absence might occur as a direct result of a sort of supplementary action. We could probably do some uh, sort of recceing, I think, of the, the, in, the certainly the, the employee relations casework information we've got against individuals and whether there is a a correlation between absence. So, so certainly happy, happy to look at that. Um, and again, I think the answer around the sort of flu vaccine uptake is probably one that, that my sort of public health colleagues might be better placed to answer. But certainly I think there is a, a case here as part of that wider wellbeing sort of strategy to start to look at actually what's the cons around pressing the message around preventative measures, particularly where we are offering that to our workforce directly, uh, you know, along with accessibility to go and attend those appointments in clinics during work time. So I think it's a really valid point and certainly one that we can take away and look at in some more detail. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll come to you in a second, Councillor Member, but just one clarification on the table on 97, which is very popular this evening. You give a scrutiny panel data and they seem to <laughs> eat it up. Um, I notice it says excluding levers at the end. So, in terms of the data here, it doesn't include anyone that's left in the period. Does that move the dial greatly? If you don't know, that's fine. Could we have the data that includes levers in here as well, please? 
Yes, thank you, Chair. Not greatly no is the answer to that question. I can certainly get you a breakdown of what the difference in the position looks like to come back to this panel. And apologies, I should have said at the start of this section that we are also missing our technical data expert who is also the report author due to the train strikes, but very happy to take that away and provide the clarification. Yeah, thank you. I think it would just be good to see the whole picture because it's still a cost incurred to RBG. So I think that would be good. Uh, Councillor Vandenbroek. Okay, I've got one last point on sickness, and then I've got some stuff on recruitment. Tell me if I go on to that or not. But the last one on sickness, just picking up about what you were saying about preventative measures. Uh, I would like to see in all crowded offices, HEPA filters. It's not just COVID that that, that helps. It's any flu, colds, any airborne disease. They don't cost much. I know I've bought them. So I would really think that Greenwich could be a leader in this. This is not a lot of money, especially in the most crowded places. It could make quite a lot of difference on infection. And then I've got a couple of questions about recruitment um, and vacancies. So is it a good time to go on to that? Yeah. Um, Really pleased with all the stuff that's going on on future of work. Just want to share a little piece of um, data that I heard recently on the radio for some recent uh, research that um, on hybrid working, um, not only did the research so show that uh, productivity was flat, i.e. the same as could be expected, but that as a recruitment tool, the offer thereof um, was the equivalent in um, encouraging people to apply as a 10% increase in salary. And given as we ain't got much money, but we've got quite a lot of uh, ability to be flexible for the right jobs, etc. Just throw that one into the next bit you're doing on the... Um, on, on the future of work, which I know, I know is, is an ongoing and there's some really interesting stuff coming up through that. Plus, one question. We know that there are loads of places where we don't have enough staff, where everybody's overworked and I've seen people practically in tears and I know how hard they're working and we've got those vacancies and we have financial pressures. And I'm just wondering if that delicate balance sometimes might affect some of our decisions about recruiting um, on the basis that while the job is empty, we're saving money. I, is that a real question? I don't know. And if it's answerable, I don't know. I think it's certainly a very helpful observation. And uh, it, it's, it's difficult, I think, to answer with any certainty. I think... I think certainly that that's a factor that is considered um, within some service areas where perhaps there is a general feeling that there is some capacity that can be mobilised elsewhere. And I think the, the report also talks to some of the increases that we've seen in things like use of honoraria, um, where again, I think there is a, a, sort of a story there potentially around how we are using that as a means of plugging some gaps temporarily. But I think... There's lots of other theories that sort of sit behind that as well, potentially. And I, I think largely the recruitment difficulties that are being experienced across the balls are probably the primary reason as to why we are seeing a lot of those um, additional duties allowances being applied. And certainly we see the business cases as they come through. Um, nine times out of ten, I think it's, it's very clear that actually there is a, a preventative factor stopping directorates or services from mobilising recruitment for whatever reason. And so this is a temporary means of keeping some other priority activity going. But, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. I think this is a really difficult... I think we all know it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult area for us and, and nationally. Um, I guess I'll kind of just share some reflections around the work that the emerging workforce strategy will sort of seek to do really to start to look at this. And I think fundamentally it's starting to move us out of a space of traditional recruitment methods and really starting to think about actually what does some of the 
key issues that we are affecting as a, as a local authority. What does that mean for the way that we are delivering services and how we use our workforce to, to undertake that key activity? Um, there is a lot of consultation that we are continuing around the sort of the shaping of that emerging strategy because we are very clear that we need to hear the voices of, of the organisation to make sure that we get that right and that it speaks to each of those other key strategic documents. Um, but there's certainly no easy answer to this, I think, is, is my sort of case in point in, in summary. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments or questions from members? So I think, Councillor Smith, were you interested in a deeper dive on sickness and absence to bring something back sooner than the next report? Do you want to just... And, and can I just say positively, um, you know, the things that we're doing in order to support employees in terms of health and well-being, I think, are to be commended. I'm, I'm particularly um, pleased on the stuff on menopause support. Um, not that I've ever had such a thing. Um, but... Um, you know, I think it's it's a really comprehensive list of things that we are doing to support um, employees, and I think it should be commended. So thank you for that. So I think if we kind of take away uh, an, an action to, and we can flesh out in more detail maybe some of the metrics that we want to see around sickness and absence and the plan, but we'll kind of maybe agree at the next scrutiny panel when there's more of us here when we might want to take that as an extra update. And, and maybe ask you for that on the sickness. So thank you if we can get that one down. Okay, Stephanie, thank you very much for that. That's great. So uh, we'll move on to item seven, which is commissioning of future reports. So this in particular relates to the next meeting that we have uh, where we're looking at street enforcement and curbside strategy. So some background on this, because it was a while ago we set the work program. This was to look at enforcement and the collection rates we get from them. I think we're all aware and it's public knowledge of the shortfall in revenue from enforcement that's creating quite a hole in the uh, MTFS. So uh, what I thought this could look like, and I'm open to other things we want to look at, is more of a deep dive into how individual enforcement, such as cameras in their own positions are performing, the rationale behind putting them there, um, and, and how that's monitored and what, what how the directorate is thinking in terms of strategies to improve performance to meet that stated target because I don't know about you but we're often told well we've put that number in because we think we can achieve it and yet we don't ever seem to achieve it so it's more of a deep dive into that but I'd be keen to hear from members what they think we'd like to look at there any of their own experiences potentially on what we could look at to come to that item. Having been the cabinet member responsible for parking myself in the past, um, I, I do think there's a little bit of a, um, I'd use the word myth, maybe that's a bit strong, uh, misunderstanding of, of why there is a deficit in parking income, because I don't think it's about numbers of tickets issued and cameras not performing and whatever. There was a couple of years ago um, a bit of a rejiggle on the way that the figures were presented um, because, you know, I know for an absolute fact that in, in real terms, the numbers of tickets per week have, have increased threefold. Um, I can't quote on the cameras because the cameras were quite new when I still had the post. Um, and, and I know that there is the flexibility to move them around and, and there's a lot more work being done now before they're cited about um, the best places to put it and, and to be able to make them flexible. But um, I think we keep saying, oh, there's this big hole in, in, a, in highways, income from parking, and there's some other things that be re rejigged around the edges. So I'd, I'd like us to actually know what that means because... You know, I don't think it is that we're not issuing parking tickets, that the cameras aren't performing, that, you know, I mean, there's always more you can do on that, clearly. Um, and that means having more staff in order to do it. And, um, you know, therein goes into the problem that we had before. But um, I think to actually understand what those figures mean when they keep getting presented as to being a huge hole rather than 
actually things are being accounted for differently. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Thank and the, the very quick explanation I had to that, so I was very keen to drive into it as well, excuse the pun, um, is that that's what we think they're capable of achieving, which still seems too broad. So I think we need yeah. to get a lot more into that. Yeah, so uh, we can do that. Okay, so again, any ideas come to mind post this meeting, feel free to drop me an email saying it'd be good to see that metric or it'd be good to get an explanation of X, Y, Z. But I will take that back via Samantha to um, get, get that clarity in the report ready for that next meeting, I think. So that should be an interesting one, hopefully. Um, in which case, that is the last item. So a very quick overview and scrutiny, but a good one, I think. So thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you.